Amazing. Okay, right, folks, we are recording. Welcome to the very first cohort call of OLS 6. Um, you may have noticed I'm excitable and I'm excited. I am delighted to be here with you today. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. I noticed we've had one or two more people join us. I'm going to go through all of our standard welcoming things. But while you are listening, uh, please do sign in your name on the etherpad. Right now, the roll call is line 57. And uh, then we also have an icebreaker question about songs that you might be enjoying to listen to. Um, so anyway, OLS 6, uh, I'm going to just ask if you are not speaking, please do leave your microphone on mute. That just makes sure that if the dog needs to woof, um, it doesn't accidentally come through or the workmen outside who are using a jackhammer, it gets a bit weird on the recording otherwise. Um, so I will occasionally use my host powers to mute if I need to. Um, but just because we've asked you to remain on mute doesn't mean that we don't want people talking. We love people talking. Just make sure to, to use the mute button and then unmute it and remute um, as needed. So let, let's go through some of our reminders. We've got a nice big long list here. Hopefully by now you've had the chance to chat to your mentor, to meet them tell them a bit about what you do, they've told you a bit about what they do and what they know. Um, and so now is week two, our first group call. Um, so if you look on the etherpad at line 80, and by the way, when I'm looking away, I'm looking at my second screen, I am still paying attention to you, but my agenda is over here. Um, so if you look in the etherpad right now, line 80, we have a code of conduct. I'm actually gonna mute for a second and just ask everyone to open that up and just take a really quick look through. The too long didn't read version is to treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive, both in our Slack space, on calls, and anywhere else. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna mute, give you a moment just to look through that and just to understand the basics of how we ask people to um, interact with one another. Um, and we have the live transcription through Zoom, but just as a reminder, there is also on the top left of the screen, we have Otter AI transcript that you can use as well. Okay, I'm not going to ask everyone to sit here in silence and read the whole thing right now, but hopefully you've had a chance to glance at it um, and maybe it's open in a tab and you can look through later. Um, folks, shall we introduce one another to each other and learn who we all are? <laughs> okay, um, Malvika, I'm just going to ask, are you in a position to maybe run this? I, I am. Yes, thank you so much, Yao. Hi everyone, I'm Malvika and I will I will be trying to get everybody introducing themselves. So as you has already introduced Etherpad, this is something we will be using for all calls. Uh, we will try to maintain it uh, for you so you can always come back to it. If you scroll down, you would actually look at uh, the lightning round. We have four keyword introduction. It's the hardest thing because we want to learn about you in the 16 weeks. We want to keep this introduction really short, but we still want to hear from you. Um, so we would like to know who, what's your name? Where are you based? What's your project name? And what's your most recent hobby? There are many, many hobbies we all have. So choose the one which is most recent that brings you a lot of joy. Um, and I'm gonna actually kick it off with actually Yo. How about you kicking it off? All right, four words only. My name. Hey folks, I'm Yo. Yo Yehudi. I didn't even introduce myself at the start. I'm in the UK near Cambridge. 
My project is definitely OLS. And my most recent hobby is doing up my summer house in the garden. Uh, I will pass it next roll call order to Nina. Hello, my name is Nina. Uh, our project is named uh, Agape, uh, op starting an open science practicing community in Ireland. I'm based in Ireland and recently I got back again to foraging. Thank you. Uh, I can pass it down on to Cassie. Uh, yep. So, hi everyone. I'm Cassie. Uh, my project's also a gape. Um, let me just look at the lightning round. Uh, yeah, so I am in Ireland as well, and my recent hobby is uh, dance. Um, I will pass it on to Umar. Uh, hello, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Umar Farouk Ahmad. Uh, I'm based in Nigeria and uh, my project is uh, a development of multi adapter kit uh, for integration with radio graphic equipment and my hobby is uh, playing football. I can pass it to Susanna. So Susanna will be introducing herself on the writing. I'm gonna actually try to wait. Um, her name is Susanna, she's based in London and uh, she actually would be working in the same organization as me for the next one year, filling the gap. <laughs> um, I'll let Susanna tell us about her project and hobby here. While, if that's okay with you, Susanna, we're gonna, I'm gonna pass it on your behalf to Noma. Good, hello, hello is better. I don't know where we are, um, but hello, I am Noma Lungelo Mapanga. You can call me Noma for short. I am in South Africa, in Pretoria. Um, my project is mapping the research um, landscape in Africa. And my recent hobby is collecting and drinking tea. Do you want to pass it to someone, Noma? Um, Moritz? Hi, uh, I'm Moritz. I am currently sitting in Rotterdam and my project is a open science platform for super resolution hardware and software and a bit of educational uh, yeah, contents in there. And I'm actually working together with, I oh know, first my poet. Um, uh, I got into rowing, so I'm in the Netherlands and there's quite a lot of uh, rowing going on. Um, yeah, uh, I'll pass it to Ron, who's my uh, yeah, co worker whatever. Okay. Thank you, Moritz. So, hi everyone, my name is Rian. I'm uh, in the Netherlands, in Delft right now. Um, so I'm the teammates with the Moritz, our project is uh, about the development of a platform for super resolution hardware and software. My recent hobby is uh, decorating my uh, room with anything related to capybaras. <laughs> okay, uh, next one, who hasn't? Um, um, Dario? Yes. I hope you can see me and hear me. My name is Dario. I come from Italy. And I'm based in Milan, in the University of Milan. Um, what can I say? My project is about uh, checking uh, research data quality. That means um, through the brains of the API, 
checking uh, the quality of the data that is being deposited into our dataverse. And my hobby is music. I play the keyboard, so I sing and so on. As a, of course, because I am Italian. Uh, that's it. Uh, the next one is uh, Io. Do you want to present yourself? I've already been. Thank you. Ah, okay. Sorry, okay. sorry. Pat, Pat Bernardo. Pat. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Pat. It's early here, so my voice. I think is the first thing I. I just mentioned, <laughs> I say, say during the day. Um, uh, I'm based in Argentina. Uh, I'm part of the OLS team. And what else? <laughs> uh, the hobby, the, um, I don't know if I have one, actually. Sorry, I was trying to think of something, but my mind, I haven't had any breakfast because I didn't want to upset my <laughs> stomach too early. So I would say taking my dogs to the bed, like all of all three of them are sick. So that would be my hobby, finding a good bed and taking them to the bed. <laughs> That's it. And I'll pass it to um, Aman. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Aman Goyal and I'm based in New Delhi, India. And my project is the Undergraduate Guide to Research Software Engineering. And recent hobby, uh, I don't know if coffee counts, like recently got into brewing proper coffee. Like I always used to find it very fancy and intimidating, the whole brewing and the French press. And yeah, I was also always an instant coffee person, but recently I got into specialty coffee. So that's one of the hobbies. Uh, okay, uh, Mahmood is left, I think. Hello everyone, uh, I am Mahmoud, I'm based in Nigeria. Uh, our project is a Open Science Community in Nigeria, um, together with one Omar and uh, Khadija. And um, well, hobbies, hobbies, hobbies. Well, I would say I like taking coffee a lot. Thank you. And I would like to pass on to uh, Ran. Thank you, Ron, as much yeah. as uh, I think you already did. Thanks okay. so much, everyone. I think we all have introduced ourselves. It's a small okay. group today, um, but we would, I hope you would still get to hear from folks who are not here today, but they'll be joining next week. So I'm going to finish by introducing myself. I am Malvika. I am based in London. My project right now is OLS, but another project that I work on is the Turing Ray. And you'll probably hear about that too. And my recent hobby. Oh God, it's hard one. It's a really hard one. I don't think I have a lot of hobby these days, but I'm reading uh, a few more sci-fi books and criticizing them. <laughs> and, and yes, Yo got me into reading some sci-fi, so I'm really grateful for that. So we are actually moving on to the next part of this call, which is about literally welcome, welcoming you again on OLS by introducing what OLS actually means. And I'll pass it to Yo for that. Thank you so much. Um, in that case, uh, Malvika, are you able to set to pre-prepare breakout rooms for the next act activity while I'm talking? Cool, okay, right. I'm gonna do the screen share thing. Uh, no, no, I pressed the wrong button. I've only been doing this remotely for how many years? All righty. Have I not made someone co-host who should be co-host? <laughs> okay, sorry, I will be with you in just a second. Make co-host, make co-host. All right, do you have the powers you need? Perfect. Right, now I will try sharing screen again. Okay, I hope that you cannot hear my neighbor's dog. She is very sad and she's slightly lonely and she is telling everyone. Um, anyway, Hey all, um, so we are so excited to have you here today. I have heard so many ama amazing projects um, and so many amazing different places where you're from. We have poor Paz who got up at early o'clock to come and join us. Thank you so much, Paz. Um, 
And we're just going to talk a bit about what OLS is. You probably have an idea because you applied to join. Um, but it's nice to have a recap and just learn a bit about the vision and where we hope we are going. So, um, by the way, am I sharing the right screen? I am? Yes, excellent. I suddenly had a panic. I've gone through entire pr presentations where people are messaging me in the chat and I haven't read it. So <laughs> wanted to make sure I'm doing this right. Uh, I am super impressed at whoever managed to update this slide really quickly while we were welcoming everyone because we didn't have PARS in this 20 minutes ago. Thank you to whoever managed to get PARS in and to squish everyone else's photo perfectly. Um, so these are the people that you're probably going to be interacting with a lot throughout all of the cohort calls over the next few months. Uh, so the first four people on the left are co-founders and directors of OLS and Paz recently joined the team about three months ago and she's been sending you a lot of the amazing emails and doing all of the coordination in a seamless and beautiful way. Uh, we are based all around the world and super proud of it, um, but we're less exciting than what the program is. So. Uh, this is a statement we will say in various different ways over and over and over again. Um, and the reason we run this, the reason that we're here with you today, is that as a group, we believe that uh, science needs to be shared, that there's, there's not a lot of point doing science, doing research, if we aren't giving it to other people, if they aren't involved in designing it, um, and then building on each other's shoulders. So that means it has to be openly and freely available. Um, I'm going to put a little star beside that because we do not say everything should be available if it is something that shouldn't be shared. Maybe there's indigenous data that people don't have rights to or maybe uh, medical data or people's travels. You know, we, we'll never advocate um, open when it means that people lose sovereignty or safety. But we advocate open when it, whenever it is responsible, safe and appropriate. Our community has grown massive over the last few years. I have never been as proud every single day to look at how many people we have, the network um, on six continents. I, I've said this far too much. I always say, it. if you know anyone on Antarctica who wants to apply to OLS, please let us know because that's the continent we haven't hit yet. But I know we will one day because the only people in Antarctica are researchers and explorers anyway. <laughs> Um, but these are some of the faces of our mentors, of people who have graduated from the other OLSs. Look at them all. This is amazing. Together we can build this. And you're part of that community now too. This is cool. This is exciting. Um, welcome. So what we do, we try and help both individuals and groups uh, to become open science ambassadors. I think early on we had a lot more individuals. These days teams tend to apply a lot more uh, because collaborating makes stuff easier, usually, so long as there's no massive team conflicts. But <laughs> if you work well with your team, then being able to split the work and brainstorm and get other ideas from each other works really well. And we hope that even um, no matter what you learn from this, that there are practices that you can take into the future that you can share with other people and it, it's not just about working on the project that you're working on today but more generally about creating um, an atmosphere and a culture of research that we share and we respect one another uh, in a beautiful way um, and like we said earlier we really believe that it really only advances if we share our work with each other and we build on each other's shoulders so this is one of the most important things that we believe that we'd much rather collaborate than compete um, and that it's a lot nicer to not have to reinvent the wheel but instead to actually reuse people's work when it makes sense and when it's appropriate and of course people are afraid of this um, it, it wouldn't be honest of us not to acknowledge that sometimes people are worried about getting scooped or um, taken advantage of or being criticized for putting their work out there um, but one of the tenets of science and of research is peer review. So we will argue that 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 really does involve putting your stuff out there in order to get it reviewed. Um, and that actually criticism is hard, but it's also possible to offer, offer it constructively and in a way that actually makes things better. Um, and that we'll never advocate criticizing people in a really mean way. Um, you know, there's always a way to say something nicely. So. What do we cover? We try and cover ways of working openly without becoming vulnerable and without having to fear that you are um, 
you're going to actually end up worse off from this, but instead that you're going to end up better off having made network connections, getting more citations and all of the other benefits that you can get from working openly. Um, and so we will explore concepts um, and we apply them to our work one step at a time. So the alternating cadence that we have where one week there's a cohort call and one week you sp speak with a mentor means that every time we talk about something in a cohort call, you might not be sure how to apply it to your project, or maybe you don't even agree, or maybe you think, yeah, this is great. Um, but because you can speak with your mentor each time, it gives you a chance to really think, how do I apply these skills to my work um, in an alternating way? Um, and this basically, I said this slide before it came up. <laughs> we have the one-on-one -on -one mentoring and we have the hands-on practice and the cohort-based training over 16 weeks. This is week two. Uh, the final week, which will be early next year, we present everything we've learned and that we've done. Um, and this will be live streamed to YouTube. Don't worry about it yet. We'll talk about it when it gets closer, but um, it's going to be a fun journey. Um, a few more credits is that OLS was born from some initiatives run by Mozilla to help people lead openly. Um, and so we will refer various times to Mozilla's open leadership framework. Um, there's a link there. Maybe someone can pop that in the chat as well. Um, I'm going to move off it, but uh, there are links to the slides in the etherpad, so this can be found later. Um, and this is a phrase that we'll see a lot of different times. Each time we highlight a different section of it. Um, so we are trying to aim that everyone be open leaders who design, build and empower their projects and communities so that people can understand the work, share their work and participate and be included within this work. This is what uh, the Mozilla Open Leadership Framework um, so if you note on the previous screen, we had design, build, empower, and understand, share, participate, and include. I'm going to hop back to that slide. You can see all of those underlined lines. Um, and this framework, at different points, we'll talk about different ways to combine understanding and designing for understanding. I think we'll talk about different times when we might be building and designing for, um, or building for participation. So we'll come back to this screen a lot as well. Um, different roles of open science communities. Right, some of the things that open science and in fact open research can mean. Um, so open data is one. You might be um, running experiments in a lab and you share your Excel spreadsheets with other people. Um, or it might be that you are doing something that is produced by machines and you share that data. Or maybe you actually can't share your data because it's private, but thinking about how, what you can share openly around data is important. Um, if you have big data or complex data, there's a very, very good chance that you are using software to visualize or to analyze your data. Um, that can be open, you can share your code. Um, maybe you don't think of yourself as a coder, but you use R, you can share that. Maybe you use an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet or SPSS to um, analyze your data. Sharing what you can as part of your scientific method, really important. Maybe you use hardware in some way to do the science that you're doing. It might be that you have a machine that you have to make yourself. Um, share those designs. Reuse other people's designs when you can. Uh, maybe you share your papers. You've written up what you're doing um, and you share that so anyone can download and read it, whether or not um, they have a subscription to a journal. Um, you can also share your protocols. So that, that's the how, the methods of what you're doing. Uh, maybe you want to share things early, preprints. Um, this is the art of actually sharing your paper even before it's officially peer reviewed. Um, you maybe want to share reviews. So this is something that I think I don't see all that much, but occasionally I see, especially on F1000. Um, so you've said, I've peer reviewed this, here's what I thought. And you've shared, sh you've shared those impressions rather than those uh, just disappearing into an editor's inbox somewhere. Uh, maybe you want to train people with the knowledge that you have um, as a form of open education. And maybe you want to work with other people to design your science. So it's not just people in the ivory tower, as we say, doing citizen science. Um, so yeah, sorry, it's not just people in the ivory tower, but it's also citizens and the public designing and collaborating on the work that you're doing. Or maybe you're networking with other people. And these are all aspects of open science um, and open research. And there's also other aspects we haven't covered today. It's really, really broad. 
uh, one of our concepts that we talk about a lot and that we think is super important is open by design. We encourage people to um, not just put stuff, build it and they will come, but think how can people engage? I want to design an experience where other people can have different pathways to be involved. Um, and why do we talk about this? Um, so this study, uh, I'm, I'm noticing it slowly get further and further away every time I present this slide. It was reasonably new when we started presenting it. It's now nearly 10 years old. Um, oh yeah, it probably is 10 years old. Um, but 160 tech companies, they found that strategic intent in openness was what made things effective. Um, which is to say that if you really think about how you do open, it's a lot more likely to be successive than if you just put it on the internet and see what happens. Um, and so we are constantly, one of our things that we reinforce is to, to try to design openness rather than just let it be a thoughtless default. Um, I think I'm nearly done. Um, if you're tired of listening to my voice, we're, we're about to move to breakout rooms. But anyway, we're hoping that you can all take in from this, that you can think about how to apply it to your context um, in ways that are appropriate. Don't apply things that don't make sense, but create a positive culture change in your community, in your area, and your project that you're working on. Um, that is the last slide. Hooray! I hope I haven't talked too long. Um, am I still scratched screen sharing? Or have I, I think I've stopped, right? <laughs> Yeah, you stopped. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Next up, um, does anyone have any questions they want to ask before we move on? All is clear for now. Super. Okay, I'm going to introduce the breakout rooms. Um, this is the first time that we've done them. So the introduction will be a bit longer <laughs> than we normally do. Um, so breakout rooms we use as ways to have small sub discussions within this breakout rooms are not recorded so we'll pause recording um, you won't have otter the transcripts in the breakout room um, and so one of the ways we make sure that there's different ways to facilitate is we ask people to either have written or spoken interactions in their rooms I realize I should have asked this before I asked you to make breakout rooms Malvika I'm sorry <laughs> Um, so folks, what I'm going to ask right now, if you would prefer a spoken interaction, edit your Zoom name and put S in front of your name. So you can see a couple of people already have W in brackets. Um, so if you want spoken, put S. If you prefer written, then put W. Uh, so to do this on my computer, I open the participants window. I click on the little more button beside my name and then I click rename. If you can't rename for some reason, just let us know your preference in chat. Uh, but I'll just pause for a moment while everyone updates their names. And I hope that was clear. Okay, I'm actually going to edit a couple of people's names and just put it in chat um, and then Malvika can do the organizing. I can go in, uh, I mean, both, any option, so whatever is needed. I think probably written. <laughs> no, no, whatever. I think I have all the info. Uh, Saranjit, I'm going to put you on the spoken room, if that's okay. If there's a problem, let me know. I'll move you around. Okay. Uh, so we should tell you what you're going to be doing in the rooms. <laughs> so, folks, um, our goal is to give you a chance just to meet one another. Um, we have some discussion prompts. If you look at the etherpad, you can see them in the etherpad as well. So even once you're in the rooms, you won't be lost. Um, but the questions are, what was your path into this program? Why are you here today? Tell everyone that. Um, 
what made you interested in working openly? Um, and how, how has working open affected your leadership? It might be that you feel like you haven't worked openly yet. So in that case, guess, say this is how I think it might affect my leadership or this is where I want to go. So if it's not something that you have experience with yet. Um, so remember, you can look in the etherpad to find these instructions again. This is line 114. Um, and I'm also going to ask every group to nominate a scribe um, and to actually write down uh, just some notes or thoughts or comments in the etherpad. So if you look at line one, two, three, you can see group one, group two, group three. You can add your names and add your notes. If you've chosen to go into the written breakout room, you can use the etherpad, uh, maybe use bullet points and sub bullet points for discussion. Or if you prefer, you can use the chat. We won't see it. The chat when you're in a breakout room only reaches the breakout room. Uh, so finally, if you need help at any point, there is an option in Zoom to ask for help in the breakout rooms, and that will just automatically transport me or Malvika or Paz into that room to come and figure out what's going on. Um, and we have uh, probably about 10 or 15 minutes for the room. How long have you set the timer, Malvika? Let's put for 15 minutes. Okay. Um, is everything clear? Can I have some thumbs up if yes? We've got thumbs. Okay, Malvika, can you transport everyone away? I can. So during the entire OLS, you would hear about a lot of frameworks and uh, some templates that we will pass to you. And the reason we will do that is to allow you to take some time to think about your own project. So you heard in the first presentation that you did that all the things that we will talk about and teach in OLS, we are only introducing the concept to you. We want you to reimagine that concept in the context of your own work. Um, and these frameworks should allow you to do that. If some places you feel that frameworks are not something that work exactly for you, please have a discussion with your mentor. But these frameworks are something that we would expect that the week after cohort calls, you would be working on them and building your own notes. Some of these uh, frameworks have been chosen because they have worked ex exceptionally well for me, you, Amy, Bernice, uh, when we were designing this program. Um, but any feedback that you have about any of them, please do reach out to us. So today we're going to do a little bit more introduction, but in the future you would find them a bit more automatic to go into. So the first framework we want to show is Open Canvas. It has always been one of our favorite tools and a lot of our cohort members have loved it. Um, and the reason for us to do that is to make you think through an open project strategy for yourself. It allows you to put everything that you know about your project in the same page. We will have an assignment at the end of this, which will be about you creating your open canvas. So this is something that you would again hear from us uh, from Open Leadership Framework, that we want to help you design and build projects that empower others to collaborate with the inclusive community. So this particular framework is about designing. And this is the area that we will be covering with this. So we are designing for understanding. We want to make sure that you have better understanding of your project and you have a way to talk about your project with others. You want to share this information with others, especially when you are building a project in a team or if you're getting more people in, involved in working with you. So designing for sharing with others and yourself. And you're also designing for participation and inclusion. When you put all this information in front of you in a single page, you're able to look at and understand what are the limitations of my project what are the hurdles that people face when they want to participate in my project? And how can I improve inclusivity when we design it? So Open Canvas comes from Lean Canvas in startup companies. Um, and the Lean Canvas are very similar. However, we have adopted this a little bit for openness. We have divided it, this Open Canvas into two. So you would think about the product and the product could be a community, a paper, a platform, anything that you're building from your project. And a, a large part of our open canvas is about community. 
So although you might not be building community actively, you want to think about who is benefiting from my project, how would they like to be involved, what is in it for them. So here's a pathway for you. How would you go about creating your open canvas? So you think you think about the problem. What are the few problems that you want to solve with your project? What is it solving that other people haven't been able to solve or other projects haven't been able to solve? Um, you want to think about solution. So what is the expected solution that these problems can be solved? What are the key metrics through which you can measure your success? So for example, let's say if you're creating a platform, the problem is that I want people in my community to discuss ethical research. The solution is that you provide them that particular platform and the key metrics could be the number of people who've joined and the number of conversations that they're having or something along that line. Then you think about resource required in order to build that solution and to achieve that metric, what resources do you need? Uh, there's a terminology MVP, minimal viable product. So you wanna think about how do I design? How do I develop? Uh, what are the requirements in terms of tools, software, hardware? And if there is any cost associated with it. So it's possible that you don't have the solution already uh, and you don't have all the resources that you need, but this will allow you to think about what, what do you want to achieve in order to uh, build that solution. Sorry, now moving down to the community part. So unique value proposition. You need to have a clear message of what you want to offer through your project, why you're different. It doesn't have to be extremely different. It's possible that you're building something similar that's been done in the past, but you're doing it for your community. So the difference could be that this is available to your community. Um, and this unique value proposition should help people to identify why they should work with you. And you would also think about main problem you're solving together with them and the story and the benefit your users may have by using that product or building that product with you. In order to build that community, you want to also think about who will be engaging with me. What is their profile? Um, just think about simple background. We'll have at some point uh, discussion around building a more detailed background of these profiles, but think about who are you building this for? Who are your early adopters, students, early career researchers, PIs, group leaders, communities, um, any user profile that you have in mind? Um, I should have actually gone from that direction of what, apology for that. I did not even follow my own roadmap. But the contributors profile, which is very similar to user profile, but the contributors profile is something where people actually contribute to your project. The user profile would be people who adopt the work that you do, but contributors are people who are working with you to develop that. What contributors channel will you give them to con communicate with each other? Do you have emails? Do you have Slack? Are there Twitter accounts you have? Are there documents you're developing? What is the way you're communicating? So communication is one of the keys where you engage your contributors and users. Similarly for users channel, it's possible your contributors have different channels, maybe a private channel we're working with them, but the users may have a different kind of forum that where they can go and talk um, about the project or the problems that they're having. So again, let me correct my, my pathway. You start with problem, find a solution, identify metrics, you you find out what resources you need. You think about who are going to work with you to build that product, who will be adopting that product, where are the different channels these people are in for unique value proposition. What is it in for the contributors and users to work with you? This is one page, but it really may take you some, you know, some time because you are trying to gather all the dispersed information. Or sometimes if your project is very new, you don't even have any of these and you'll have to think through what you would like to build. So I would actually skip through because we have already covered that. So we talked about product, we talked about community, we talked about problem. We've talked about solutions, key metrics, resource requirement, contributors profile, user profile, sorry, then you have project execution. So this one is about these contributors using the resources that you have in mind. 
um, in order to be able to participate and contribute more effectively. So for example, in OLS, we would be thinking about resource requirement in terms of micro grants that our co contributors in OLS, which would be you, would require. We also have channels like Slack channel, mailing list that people require in order to have conversation, ask questions, get information from PAS, for example. Um, and anything that they would need, they, would, they should be able to contact us. Therefore, we have our email. So think through, you can always take OLS as an example. It's not the only example, but this is the closest that we have that we can clarify for you. We talked about user profile, who are the adopters. We talked about channels, how you can gain new channels, gain new contributors is also something you need to think about. It's possible that you have a closed channel for people to work within the team, but you should also have a pathways for new contributors to come in and work with you. We talked about user channel. And here we will be working through community engagement. So later in the cohorts, we will talk a lot about community building, community engagement, um, and talking about how it's not just enough to put the channel in place, but also build ways for people to talk to you, engage with each other, and build momentum for the project that you're building. And unique value proposition, a clear message that stays, states what, what you offer and why you are different. So with that, I'm going to show you an example of uh, a, a project. It's a very simple example. And this project is called Contributors Badges for Science. Um, the example could be that a project wants more people to adopt open science and get recognized by it and badges are something very visible. So their problem is that often we think that there is lack of recognition on certain contributors type on academic paper. So often people think that the first authors are the real authors and middle authors are not recognized. So how can we improve that? That's one of the problem. Another is that the papers aren't taking advantage of web as a medium. So papers are still very static. People download a PDF and read it. It doesn't have a way to engage. So how can we engage that? The solution is award badges to authors on in academic paper based on their contributions. So it could say um, a badge which says that person contributed to designing the project or contributed to project management, contributed to visualization, whatever. Key metrics is number of publishers using those badges and number of badges awarded. So the badge is awarded to the authors and this one adopted by the publisher. The re resource requirement could be that someone needs to build a process for development. Someone needs to design it. Someone needs to talk to publishers and ORCID. Uh, so ORCID is something we'll talk about again, but this is an IT persistent identifier for academics or scientists like us. It doesn't matter what our name is, we are assigned an IT that is connected to different projects. So our contributors profile is developers and at the publisher, uh, developers who are working with publisher, developers who are working with ORCID and also researchers who can code and they want badges. So they want to help and they can bring their user perspective. And our users are publishers, our users are ORCID and also researchers. So it's very similar in this case, which is one of the things we would also talk about. How can we make our users contributors in the project? That's one of the things that open science is able to do that. So not just building in a product because we, we think someone might be interested, but we go to the potential user and say, what are you interested in? Would you like to build it with us? And that's how we sometimes try to look at open science as a tool to empower people to become contributors to the product that they want to use. The channels in it uh, would may include Twitter, giving talks in the conferences that people will hear, writing blogs, writing uh, different kind of features. And the unique value proposition in this case is issuing badges to credit authors on academic paper. Um, so why would people want to be part of this is that they want to be recognized. Badges for authors on academic paper. So different authors, not just first author being recognized for their contribution and get author roles on your paper, as in you can specifically show what exactly you did in the paper, if that is going to help in your um, future career. I think I've spoken a lot. Um, want to end with this link, which is also linked in our etherpad and most likely in your template for your mentor mentee. So after this call in the next week, please do come back and create an open canvas for you.
I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open up for any question. Okay, we have a cat here. Um, not any question. Hi, Khadija, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to then pass it to you because we have a breakout room again planned for you. Super, thank you, Malvika. Uh, so folks, apologies. I hope you can hear me through my cat. He is literally between me and my microphone. Um, we're at breakout room. Okay, we've talked a bit about open canvas as a tool to help define where you want to go. Um, you might need to be um, think of it as something that allows you to think through the process rather than a boring form to fill out. Um, so what we're going to suggest now is to talk about in your breakout rooms with your uh, breakout room colleagues what your mission and vision might be. Um, and so if you look on the etherpad, lines 182 and 183, um, the guidance is to articulate your big idea, vision or dream that you want to achieve and experiment with expressing your vision in a short format. Uh, some people might call that the elevator pitch, as in if you only have a minute to talk to someone um, in the elevator about your project, how would you do it? Um, and then try and write that down in one or two or three sentences, but not much more than that in the etherpad. So the groups will be two people per room. Uh, we might need occasionally to have three just to make out the numbers working. Um, Malvika, how's it going? It, I might have mixed up, uh, so it's possible some people might end up in the same room. Um, while I'll leave the written room in the same room, but what I will do is allow you to change your room if you would like, uh, just to give you a little bit more flexibility to meet more people. Okay, okay. and then I'll open it for eight minutes. Take it away. How to get involved. So, um, you might get really excited from reading the project summary and be like, I want to be part of this, right? And so a good roadmap should provide sort of a very easy to understand, very easy to action on um, sort of guidelines to point to parts of the project that they can immediately work on, be it, you know, you can help edit a certain part of, uh, of the content or pick up, um, pick up uh, sort of help spot bugs or report them all these sort of things and should point to additional documentation like contributing guidelines that people should check out. Um, last but not least, the timeline, the start of the roadmap. Um, there are very good examples of how this is done, but essentially a timeline is organized by time. So you could have things like, you know, what's happening this month and next month and next year, right? Um, it should map, you know, what you're working on now and then where it is, where the project is going next. It should also have milestones. So, you know, are you organizing an event in the next half a year? That's a major milestone. You should put it on there so that your contributors will know about it and can know how they can contribute to the organization or the participation in the event, for example. There are different timeframes, uh, short, medium, long-term, that means differently for every single project, but have a think about what that means for you and what those time, how, the, you define the major milestones within your project and how you sort of line them up against time. So now you have the main milestones. Um, you can actually break them up further into tasks um, so that uh, each task will contribute towards reaching that milestone. And in each task, you can have a little bit more details about what needs to be done, what the success looks like, pointers to get started, and also why is the task important for the overall vision of the project. Um, I encourage you strongly to sort of look at this uh, slide uh, in your own time. Uh, there are a couple of examples that are pointed to here that will help you understand more concretely what I've just sort of whirled my way through in the last five minutes. Um, 
you can there are many ways that you can store the roadmap and you'll see that in this example i can link it in your github repository you can have it in a readme file which we'll explain more i think next time um and uh many other ways there's no fixed equation i've seen it done on a trello board yeah so if you find any other interesting examples as well please feel free to share that in slack i'd love to know with that i think i'm done sorry i did overrun my own time but uh I hope that was kind of clear. <laughs>